eco-technology pioneer, Jerry Northrup, is uh, providing examples of the ways he figured things out in eco-technology. This is the fourth episode in which I'm interviewing him about that. And uh, at this point, um, I've uh, made a sketch of 24 ways that he figured things out. And the central way I've realized is working in parallel with the ecological system, uh, whereby it's the ecological system that uses its creativity to solve the problem. And uh, the organizer, manager, um, Jerry, is uh, applying his own aesthetics, personal uh, sense of what is beautiful, what should work, developed um, because of the effort he's made to be an instrument engaging biological systems. And uh, formally, uh, he does uh, sometimes speak of the Goldilocks maximum entropy principle. So uh, there's a maximum entropy principle where uh, in trying to uh, work with a system you'd or understand a system, you'd uh, as assume um, how to maximize entropy. But uh, in practice, that's very hard to calculate. So what he does um, is to uh, look at the upper bound for that, do a calculation, look at the lower bound for that, do a calculation, and then pick something in the middle that would seem right and do that calculation. So he calls that the Goldilocks uh, maximum entropy principle. All of this to say um, that um, the key role of aesthetics, and he does have a great love for art, uh, for uh, his wife, uh, Lynn, who's an artist, uh, a sculptor. They do talk a lot. And so we see that he is an artist. So he'll give an example with the Fibonacci numbers. I am Andres Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Okay, Please. relative to the structure of, of physical timber fish or wastewater treatment type systems, uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, construction guidelines are, are fixed by the engineering community and a set of, of standards that they follow and it uses uh, what is uh, most efficient to construct from a construction standpoint. So you have circular tanks with conical bottoms or rectangular uh, tanks and, and things like that. And it, it is often done with, with just what you wanted for a volume and how to fit it into a space. When I did timber fish, um, <clears throat> we decided that because of the lay of the land, the, the system in Westfield, that uh, we would have rectangular tanks. And so I would have different cells, like there would be an introductory cell or a sub tank that would be for influent waste. Then there'd be a, a, a cell for chips, a cell for aeration, a cell for chips. And I put the dimensions in basically based on the Fibonacci number series. So the basic tank, that was two tanks. Uh, it was eight feet deep. It was eight feet wide. And there were two of them side by side. And I divided them into an initial tank that was three feet long. The next one was a chip zone, which was five feet long. The next one was a aeration zone, which was eight feet long. Then there was a five foot chip tank and a, an eight foot. So that they were those modules the basic operating value volume was three feet deep. So you had a three foot, uh, a five foot uh, aeration tank that was five foot by eight foot by eight foot. And you could then do a, a chip tank, which was five foot by eight foot by eight foot, because you could put three feet of chips on top of a water level, which was five feet deep. So the notion was, okay, why would you do that? Why would you think that a microbial system would function well in something which is basically the golden mean, the numbers to get that? And, you know, it was approximate because of, of the way construction goes and, and how to get these notions. They weren't precise measurements. But the notion was that there is some kind of reason where complex microbial systems in different environments 
would relate to each other well in a golden mean type of structure as opposed to an arbitrary configuration of rectangular or circular tanks. So there's that kind of thing. And there's there's no basis for that, particularly other than an aesthetic value. And I remember um, one of the guys who, who may become a part of, of how we move forward, who was basically just a, a helper Oh, no, we contracted with a guy who did uh, some of the cleaning around the system uh, and, and general maintenance, helping put chips in and that kind of stuff. So he was there as a, as a, as a, as a worker, a laborer with that. And he started asking questions about how did you, uh, how did you choose that? And so I explained that and he was totally enthralled with it because, you know, he said, oh, he's, he's a genius all the way down in terms of, of elements that nobody else would uh, particularly consider. So I think there's a lot of that and it comes back, I, I suspect, to how you look at tetrahedral structures, how you could look at, at um, spherical close packing, what that means in terms of, of again, this model of the Quaternion, and the tetrahedron, the fourfold, eightfold types of patterns. What does it mean in geometry, physical geometry, concrete and steel? And how did that relate then to uh, the biomass that was growing within that? And not only just the bacteria, but then what kind of structures are best to facilitate the growth of worms, like the aquatic worms, which are a really great tool in this is how do you build environments for the aquatic worms to interact with the liquid um, suspended growth microbial systems and also with the fixed film microbial growth systems in the chip zones. And there, there are these kinds of issues that were meaningful to me. And you know that's not part of any engineering. Um, nobody would get a, a sense of that from looking at engineering specifications. We had a we had a guy that worked for Bion for quite a while. He was really good. He was a um, he was essentially a geologist and a and he got an environmental an environmental master's degree in environmental engineering. Uh, from uh, from a geological type of background, and he got into working with the timberfish system. And he went back and looked at the literature. He came to me and said, "You know, this is contrary to almost everything you find in your engineering manuals, manuals, but it really works." And we wanted to know why why that <laughs> was the case. Uh -huh. um, so then I would have that kind of experience frequently with people who would work with us, and. You know, what, what I say, well, I would use the golden mean and say, what? Well, why? How does that make any sense? But it doesn't. And yet I have a sense that it does in some ways. Um, so, so this is very precious, NC, um, to hear it from you, uh, to hear, um, well, to hear your experience, because you've actually gone through this process, which is very rare. And, then, you know, this to, to learn that from you. And then to see that, um, you know, to think about, well, what's going on here? You know, that's that's what I'm thinking. And so the answer that I kind of make up is that, well, you as a steward of this system, trying to build a lovely environment for the system, you are, um, and you're in a situation of ignorance in a certain sense. You don't know. Right. Yeah. But so it's a little bit like your maximum entry principle, but in a philosophical way, it's like you're saying, well, so if you don't know, you should just do what you think is most beautiful, right? Yeah. Like or the, the logic that you think, like you should rely on your own aesthetic. Your aesthetic will be optimizing something in some way, in some kind of like consistent way. Now we can imagine that the bacteria, the, the bacterial community is also optimizing in its own kind of way. So if it has a logic of optimization and you have a logic of optimization, well, that's going to work better than chance, right? right? Yeah. And so that's the best you can do, I think. So that's an interesting, uh, you know, so if you really uh, have a um, genuine, uh, heartfelt, you know, belief that something is beautiful or optimal or, you know, loving, it's. I think that's the yeah. way that parents raise their children. 
Yeah. So, and it, it can be mindless and it can fail, but you know, but maybe but the chance sure. of success is maybe greater than it would be yeah. without then and see also the chance of learning from that. Right? right. Like you can then you can abandon the whole system and say, no, it's not the golden mean, it's something yeah. else. Right. So well. Any engineer who would look at that would say it's totally irrelevant. You know, it has nothing right. to do with each other. You're just indulging your own whims or what have you. Well, and so the crucial thing is that indulging your whims is maybe one of the key ways of figuring things out. That's yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's well, this comes back to again watching how Lynn works. Mm -hmm. It's just just fascinating to me in, in all kinds of ways. She has lots of what I would consider to be unique abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, to match colors like a, a when you try and match a paint swatch with something else she can hold it in her mind and go out not carry a sample or anything and, and find something that is absolutely spot on mm -hmm. and um, you know she just just seems to know she doesn't she doesn't measure very much but she has a real sense of when things fit how they go together <clears throat> Uh, another story that, that we like is that she was designing a toy one time mm -hmm. uh, and it involved a, a mechanism. It was kind of a little race car toy. So here she was looking for springs that would have certain tents. And so she went to a, an industrial supplier of springs for the engineering uh, fabrication and construct mm -hmm. construction communities. And so she's picking up the individual springs in these uh, little bins and, and testing them with their fingers. And the guy comes over and asks to help, so she apologizes for, you know, that she's just an, art, an artist and she's looking for springs and that uh, she knows the engineers come in with a bunch of different things. But they, and the guy said, no, they do what you do. They come in with the engineering specifications for springs and then they do the same thing. They're going <laughs> around and picking up the springs and they're going like this. Tremendous story about mm -hmm. you know how we are used to viewing things and doing things, and how a different kind of way is going. So it was, and there's you know there's a lot of experiences sort of like that as to how you look well, at something from a different way, and, and that's that speaks to the human body as an instrument, you know, or the whole human being as an instrument, yeah. where you know like there's it's half of the story is applying yourself as this godly, wonderful instrument and just picking up the spring and playing with it. Yeah. And then um, the other half is to say, okay, well, then what's all the, you know, other information or science or, you know, knowledge. Yeah, well, There's you this whole knowledge you can direct with. Things should be and all that. So. Uh, and yeah. then, so that may be the capstone um, of the whole system. Uh, I would not be surprised uh, because in the end, it's about like, Calibrating yourself, you know, calibrating the the you know, creating an environment for these microbial systems that are just you know, yeah, it's, people it's, didn't even know about a thousand years ago, you know. So right, yeah, it, it's about developing a sensitivity for something that is there and and paying attention to it, watching and and looking and and thinking, you know, what's going on here? Or how how can I? you know, talk to the trees in a way, what would they tell me? And, and, and so developing that aesthetic sense is kind of like mirroring, you know, seeing through the mirror into your own space, into your own thing. And if you can calibrate that, um, then that is going to make things work all the better for the system that you're interacting with, I think. Uh, but but it, like, you know, in terms of communicating with your, your own intuitions. But yeah. another thing I'd like to, some holes I'd like to fill in this uh, uh, epistemology would be trying to figure out the learning cycle. Uh, like, how is it that you learn? You know, what are examples where you learned? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, let me think about that. It, it's, I do a lot of observation mm -hmm. and you look and you develop, I don't know, kind of capabilities. One of the things that Lynn mentioned that I should probably tell you is that I find four-leaf clovers. Uh-huh, for example. You come out into a yard or something, there's a lot of clover, and I can walk by, I don't look for them, but they jump out at me. Oh. And I can just, just find them. And a lot of people have noticed that when you go around and they try and look for them. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you're down there and you're looking, 
and you don't find them or you find mm -hmm. one very occasionally. Mm -hmm. Whereas I used to be able to, my eyes aren't quite as good as they used to be, but I used to be able to go out and they just, just pop out. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of sensitivity. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think it can be learned, sort of. Um, my daughter and, and Lynn do better than most people. On My dad used to do that too. That kind of uh, nag. So what does that mean? How does it go? Or what is it? Um, how do you take that ability or sensitivity and extend that into then, I want to build a working system of some sort mm -hmm. where aspects of it are obvious to the system itself or what have you. So, but yeah, yeah. this, the question, how do I learn is interesting and I'll think about that one. Yeah, because that may be like one leg of it, you know, and this idea that you are an instrument. So that would be one leg of it. And then maybe in terms of how you pursue your interests, right? Because, you know, you that's kind of like an end product, right? Like you end up the yeah. sensitivity. But what is it you want to do? Like, what is it that, what is it that, for example, you were interested in fish, right? Like, why would fish, yeah. why would fish be interesting to you? Okay. And this may be, oh. see, this may be crucial in engaging others because this may relate really in terms of your personal passions. So yeah. something that may be absolutely dreadful for somebody else, but see, if you can hook into someone's passions, then all of a sudden it turns out, oh, they see past everything and they see they're in some kind of beautiful world, right? And so the question is like, where did your, where, where were your passions here? How did they, how did you find them, discover them? Yeah. The, again, there's there's like got lots of, of similar kinds of stories as to how that mm -hmm. developed and what have you. So I can think about those and, and we can flesh that out. Yeah. So I'm very happy that you you gave this these these stories because that's exactly, you know, those are those are helping to thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. All you have to do, you go to patreon.com on the internet. You do a search, Math for Wisdom. It comes up. It's real easy. It takes three or four minutes. You fill out a few boxes and you can become a Math for Wisdom Patreon supporter. It's easy. I did it. <laughs>